so as we start up today, just so you all see this, because I would mentioned this yesterday, I did find a bunch of my lectures from last year that I did on iOS. All right, so I've got them, and you can see right now they're all being um, moved up to YouTube. They're just about all done. Before I put them out there and actually make them available to everybody, I'm going to make sure I look at them first, just because of the fact that at that time we were using, since we were doing stuff on the Mac, I was using a version of Camtasia for the Mac, and it didn't always produce very well. All right, so I'll, I'll double check on those, and then I'll just throw all those. So they'll be out. There'll be extra lectures. It'll be under the 152, 149. All right. Next week, too, I'm going to give you an, uh, a, I'm going to have to see if I can get copies made, because uh, about a 100-page long uh, little mini book on iOS, and we're going to go over that. And I don't know if you, I, I didn't know whether or not to give you the news today or wait until Tuesday. We're, we're going to be using those machines. We're not, they're not going to virtualize. No, it's, it's, uh, it's too long of a story. The, the per, one of the people in IT is leaving. She took a job in St. Louis. So until they get somebody, and, and it's going to take at least a month before they hire a replacement for her. And if it might be longer than that. All right, so that, you know, they were saying to me, yeah, well, you can, you can apply. No. But uh, so we're just going to make do with what we have. All right, it's not, it's not the ideal for me either. But we're just going to do the best we have with what we've got. So. Yeah. We're going to try something. I don't know how it's going to work. I'm going to bring Sean in here next week. I'm going to bring Sean in here next week. And I, I want to know if it, no, I want to know if it's possible for, you know, what I've always been told is whatever's showing up there is what's being recorded. But we also, we, we've got a jack in here where you can hook up a laptop. So what I want to do is I want to hook up the laptop, and I want what's on the laptop to show up there, but I want, I want what's recorded to actually be on this machine. See what I'm saying? So, and, and I, I don't know if that's possible. Sean can listen to it in, in 30 seconds. He's a very intelligent person. You can tell me, yes, we can do that, or no, we can't. All right. That's the, the other thing. When I, when I talk to them, I can show you the email. They said, Denise is leaving, and then they said, it's going to be at least a month before we're able to do anything. I mean, I'll be happy if it's done by the end of the semester, to be honest with you, because then we have it for next semester. I mean, I'd like to have it done this semester, but we'll, again, we've got to do it with, with, work with what we've got. So. That's a possibility. Okay. Uh, we have a meeting Tuesday with Kristen. Send me an email if you think about it, reminding me of that, and I'll bring it up at our meeting and see what she says. All right. So we're on Chapter 13 of 14 that we're going over in this book, okay? Advanced GUI apps. I'm not going to read the stuff there to you. You can see it all. The good news is I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about list boxes, combo but, uh, boxes, etc., because they work the same regardless of whatever language you're working in. So, you know, to, to talk about selected index, selected value, we've done all that stuff before, in, with some of it more than once. <coughs> so what I want to concentrate on in here is, what's in, is on what's new, all right? And that is mnemonics and tooltips, file choosers and color choosers and menus, all right? Most of the rest of the stuff is fairly simplistic, so we're going to talk about that. Mark brought up a good point yesterday. We were walking up the stairs together, and, okay, thanks. And, and we were talking, and he said he was wondering because uh, I'm paraphrasing, and I know he'll correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, he should. But under the homework, what I had put in there, for example, under chapters 12 and 13, originally for chapter 12, we were going to do one of these problems as a class, the Joes, which we did, and then the one I was going to assign was this travel expenses thing. All right? And we didn't because we decided instead to allow you to... Uh, to, to keep working on the, the one that you're working on. And then for chapter 13, what we were going to do in class, and we didn't, was the shopping cart system, and the other one I was going to assign was this meal planner. So what I'm going to do is I think I've got all of them done. I'm going to look for those, and I'm going to put them out on the system. The only thing is, just so you know, they're not done under Eclipse. So what you're going to have to basically do is go into Eclipse if you want, if you want to run these under Eclipse. You're going to have to go into Eclipse, create a, a, like a class for each one of those, like what I have, and then copy the information in. Okay? 
not that that'll take that long. I just, I'm sorry, I don't have the time to do it. But I'll have to find them, so I, I, I'll do a search for them during the break and see if I can find all that stuff. All right? They all worked, you know, and, and the, the, the shopping cart isn't that cool. You can drag stuff over, add stuff, remove stuff, etc. I mean, it all works. That dorm meal planner, that works. But when I did it, I didn't do it with GUIs. I did it the old-fashioned bump and grind way where I coded the stuff in there, kind of like we looked at in the last chapter. So it's all in there, and it all works. But I don't think I did anything GUIized. I'll have to check, okay? All right. We talked a little bit about this last time. This is a very incomplete picture. This picture is in your book also. It looks on page 844. But just so you know, what they're showing here, and let's just look at this part, okay? So you can see that under container, everybody see where you got this thing that all this J stuff? Well, there's also a bunch of stuff way over here that you can't see that are non-J stuff. They're the AWT stuff. So all they're showing here is this, is this is the stuff in the Java EWT package, but there's more stuff down here that they're not showing, all right? Probably because they don't have enough width on the page to show it all. <clears throat> all right. In essence, in essence, a read-only read text field is a label. Does that make sense to people? The difference between a read-only text field and a label is you literally can't click on a label while the program's running. It can't get the focus. But even if a text field has been set to read-only, you can still click on it. You can't change it, but you can click on it. It can get the focus. All right? If you want to go and take a regular, you know, so for instance, let's say that I was doing this. All right? So I'm making, let's just pretend I built this. I didn't, but let's pretend I did. Well, if I type in 7 times 55 and I hit enter, I shouldn't be able to change that. All right, because otherwise I'm saying I can change math. Okay, so that would be an example of something that I would set the editable to false on there. Okay, and that's what they're telling you. So if you want to take a text field and you want to make sure that it's not possible for anybody to change what's in there, you set the editable to false. By default, it's set to true. Okay, so you don't have to worry about setting it, unless you were going to go back and forth, make it editable and non-editable for some reason. All right, then you can do that. All right, example of a real simple list box. Notice it's a J list. All right, and when you set it up by default, when you set up a list box, only one thing can be selected. But they also have a thing in there where you can you can set the true, which you can allow for multiple selections. So notice how you typically set these up. It's kind of like the way, so this one that you see up here on the page here, on page 846, you set it up as two different lines of code that you see down here. First, they've created an array, a string array called names that has in it Bill, Jerry, Greg, Jean, Kirk, Philip, and Susan, all right? Then you go in and you say that name, you know, that names is gonna be part of a new name list, a new J list that's referred to as name list. And all, the only reason I'm trying to show you this is we're spoiled. At least I am. I don't want to do that. I want to get into Visual Studio and just drag the sucker out there and not even have to worry about it other than maybe changing his name. That's not how it works in this language. Okay. Notice that by default, it's single selection mode. This is kind of a weird thing, just so you know. If you look at this, so by default, with single selection mode means you can only choose one of them. Okay. You can set it to single interval mode, which means you can choose as many as you want, but they have to be connected. All right, you understand what I'm saying? So I couldn't choose Bill and Susan if I was in single interval mode. The only way I could do that would be to, to choose all of them. Okay? So you, what you're doing is you're force peop forcing people to only choose things that, that naturally are belong together or all of them. And you can choose multiple, which means you can choose as many as you want in any order you want. Okay? So they show examples here. There's single, there's single interval, and there's multiple interval. Notice again, as always, they're set up with Java constants. When you've got a list box, see what it says? It generates a list selection event. So it's the list selection interface that you have to implement. 
it's yet another one. We looked at action listener last time. There's mouse listener. There's keyboard listener. There's a bunch of these different listeners. All right. And it also needs a, a thing called value changed. That it needs to have a, uh, a method in there called value changed. But does this stuff make sense to everybody? Selected value, selected index. We, we talked about that already in other classes. But if you want to set it, it's set selected value. If you want to get it, it's get selected value. All right, type of thing. So they've got a real simple example here, and it is. It's just what they've done is they've, dis they've set up an array with all 12 months of the year in it. Okay? And then they set it up so that you're able to go in there and choose whatever month you want, and it's single selection. So whatever one you choose, it comes up in a text box down below. Not really a whole lot of rocket science in the program, but it works just fine. Then they mention if you want to, you can put a border around it. That almost looks, to me at least, not quite, but almost like CSS. All right. And it's one pixel. Again, you can make it real wide if you want to, but it, after a while it ends up distorting whatever you put inside of there if you make it too big. Typically, if you see a border, it's going to be only a pixel or two long. All right. <clears throat> This set visible row count, that says how much of it do you want to show at a time. So if I set the visible row count to three like they show right here, all that's going to show is January, February, and March. The rest is there, but sometimes if, if your, your screen realty is at a minimum, you might have a bunch of stuff you've got on the same screen. You might only want to show part of it at a time. In fact, I think they meet. Uh, I thought they showed. There it is. And it automatically puts in the uh, slider, you know, the down arrow for you. So they go back and run the same program, but they run it using a scroll. And again, they set the visible row count to six. And you'll notice that all that shows by default then, oh, I thought they showed it, but they didn't. It's just uh, January through June, first six months. <clears throat> the cool thing is you can add items to this so notice they've got that string of names, but you can, depending on how you work it out, if you're working with an array list as opposed to an array, because notice we're filling that up with an array, right? But remember, we talked a little bit about just a couple pages in the chapter, an array list, which can dynamically shrink and can I dynamically grow, all right? Well, if you've got a, if, if instead of filling this up like they have with an array, you fill it up with an array list, you can make what's in that uh, list box shrink and shrink and grow. George Bush. Shrink and grow. All right. So they give you another example here where what they're what they're doing is they're allowing you to change as much or grab as many of these as you want to. And they set it up to multiple select. So whatever ones you grab end up after you click get selection, they end up going in the box down below. Combo boxes, as it says, allows you to select an item from a drop-down list. All right, we call them drop-down lists in other in other classes. So before, when we did this, we did a new J list. Now we're doing a new J combo box. And notice what it says here. Initially, the only thing that appears there is the first name with a down arrow. Once you click the down arrow, it shows you everything else. So this is the same stuff we we just previously saw, but again, if once your list box gets too big. You're not gonna, you won't have enough room on the screen to put everything. So you will oft times will use a drop down list. Does that make sense? So notice it says there are two methods within the combo box that you can use to determine what's been, what's been selected. Get selected item and get selected index. So you've seen this kind of stuff before. If I said get selected item right there, it would give me bill. If I said get selected index right there, it would give me zero. If there's nothing in the drop-down list, the selected index is negative 1. So this would be selected index 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And this would be selected values Bill, Jerry, Greg, Gene, Kirk, Philip, and Susan. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. 
and they give you a program that just shows it. Notice, as it says, set editable. So let's say that we put Phil in there, and Phil got really upset because you wanted it to be Philip, not Phil. If you set the editable to true, when you've got the drop downs, you can change what's in there. All right, so for instance, maybe Bill shouldn't have been in there, it should have been William. So you can remove that. Maybe it shouldn't have been Bill, it should have been his brother Bob, or something like that. So you can physically go in and change them if you do that or Mark. Yeah, I got I got a I got a brother with Mark, but it's he's he's got K on the end of his name. Yeah. Yeah, but he's see you're not weird, he's weird anyway. So yeah. All right. Then next they get into talking about displaying images in labels. All right. And it says here images may be displayed in labels and buttons. You can use the image icon class to get the image from a file. So you've got your choice. What they're saying here is you can take a lab, uh, uh, an image and put it in a label, or you can say that you want the face of the button, as an example, to be a label, if you want to do that. Notice to display the image, first you create an instance of the image icon class, which you use to read the contents of the file. Again, since it's part of Java X.swing, which you are importing anyway, you've already got it in there. So they've done something like this here. Image icon image equals new image icon smiley.gif. That assumes that smiley.gif is located right where you you know right where the regular file is. The only reason I'm telling you that is if you look real closely here, uh, that's no, that's 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 your C program, so that's not going to help much. I want to mention this to you. I had a student who uh, <coughs> was he's. It's Dave that she was talking about before, who's basically taken a couple classes, would be the equivalent of online. But um, I want to show you something, because this has bit people before, and I just want to make sure you understand this. All right. This is his Chapter 10 program, and he was having a problem with it. Okay? Not, it's not really a big thing one way or the other, but there's all of his stuff. All right, so you know there's the package, right? There's the package, boom, the stuff we've been working with. But what can happen is if, I've seen people do this before, they go in and they grab an image. Okay, you with me? Everybody grab, you grab an image and you drag it in and you put it right there. You put it under your source folder. So it's not in your package, it's under the source folder. See what I'm saying? And then you go and you, you, uh, you oh, just a minute, there's something wrong here. Because you go to run and it doesn't show. So either you have to put it in here, or you have to get the exact path to that and put it in there. All right? And yesterday, we, well, Mike's gone. I don't know if you were work, we were working with Mike. I don't know if you were there when we were working with him or not, but I know that Mike was. We kept trying to tell him. What he was doing is on his path, he had a CSS folder and he had an images folder. But what he was doing was when he was giving the path to the thing, instead of saying, you know, the images folder or the CSS folder, he had CSS slash images. He was, he was alluding to a folder that didn't exist. And then he couldn't understand why it wasn't showing. All right? And we walked him through it and walked him through it. I think by the end it finally made some sense to him. But again, the system isn't smart enough to know that if you tell it, you know, if you put something someplace else and it doesn't know where it is, it doesn't know to go look for it. All right? The other thing on that, too, because this is, bless you, this is, this is the thing that, that he uh, sent me today. I'm going to show you this quickly, because I know that there have been at least a couple of you who have had this same problem, and I want to make sure you understand this. I thought it was production worker. Just grab this is this is like it, so I'll just grab that one. Dave, if you watch this, it's nothing to do with, with you or your code. I've just this is a problem that many people have had, so I wanted to quickly go over it. All right. Let me make that a little bigger. That's plenty big. And 
what I'm about to tell you, if you go, well, I already knew that, then that's good. All right. So this says if E is greater than or equal to 0 and E is less than or equal to 250. All right. What that means is that's an inclusive range. That means give me every number between 0 and 250. Does that make sense to everyone? All right. But what he had done was he sent me, he said it's not working, and he had this. What's the problem with that? I know, it, it, you're right, it's horrible. What's the problem with that? No, it's just the opposite. That reaches every number there is, because every number is either greater than 0 or it's less than 250. Every number that's ever existed. So if you say this or this, remember only one of them has to be true, or they can both be true. So as soon as you say x greater than or equal to 0, that's all the positive numbers. And as soon as you say, or e rather, as soon as you see, say e less than or equal to 250, that's all the negative numbers. And then he was wondering why that was never, you know, this was, that was never being thrown no matter what he put in. Okay. Does that make sense? So this is an, when you put this in, that's an inclusive range. When you put this in, that's an exclusive range. All right, it's, it's an error many people make a lot. All right, but again, if, if you're doing something like that and you have a problem, then, then take it and work on it one at a time. Just look at them one at a time. Comment out the other half and then go back and take a look at them. Again, we've all done it. I still do it. All right, so notice what they've done here. They have both created a label with the smiley in it, and they've added the smiley to have a nice day on the face of their button. Remember one thing about Java is the width of the button is predicated by what you put on the button's face, right? So if you end up putting a bunch of, you know, if I wanted to put a bunch of happy faces on there, I could make a really wide button really fast. All right, then, uh, I don't know if this is Gaddis' cat or not, but he's got some programs in here where it says, click the button to see an image of my cat. You click it, and that's what you get. Okay? Fine and dandy. All right, let's talk about some stuff that is fairly new here. All right, a mnemonic, you all know what a mnemonic is, because notice right here if I click File. The save as is, is, notice that there's a mnemonic there, right? So if I do an alt A, it'll do a save as, correct? Those are mnemonics. And you can set up different kinds of mnemonics in Java just like you can in other languages. Most of them work the best when you do alt followed by something. Why am I telling you that? Well, how many letters are there? 26 the last time I checked. So if you're going to use, if you're going to have something fairly, you know, I bet you there's more than 26 mnemonics if I go through this and all of these, and all of these, you know, etc. There might be more than that. So sometimes what you'll see is it's alt something. Sometimes it'll be control something. Sometimes it might even be shift something. Sometimes it's control and alt and something, etc. All right? I've never done more, more mnemonics than probably about a half dozen at any one time, unless I've had a, a really complex um, menu that I've been creating. But the problem is when you do this, you have to let the system know everything. So what this is doing is it's creating a new button, all right, and the button will be, you know, basically it's called exit button, and it'll have on its face exit. If you want it so that it reacts to alt X, then as it says, you have to set a mnemonic for it like that. Again, I, as I've said to you before, the system is only as smart as the abilities that you give it. So if you don't tell it that, it won't know to do it. All right. And as it says there, that's supposed to show like that, but a lot of times it doesn't appear. All right. But I've still had it work with even it doesn't appear. So notice in here, you end up writing a lot of code like this. Create three radio buttons and assign mnemonics. So you're making three radio buttons, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And you want to be able to do an Alt B for breakfast, an Alt L for lunch, and an Alt D for dinner. So that's the code that you've got to put in there in order to be able to do that. So putting this stuff in there for these three check radio buttons and these three check boxes gives you that. 
but again, you can now use the mnemonics with it. Okay. You can set up tooltips, but again, it's only going to be, if you want to do that, you have to call the set tooltip text and pass it in the text you want it to have. So notice what they've done here. This is that exit button that you see up above. I mean, that would be a stupid tooltip because if a person can't figure out to click here to exit, they probably shouldn't be running the program anyway. But the idea is you can put anything you want in and you can set up tool tool tips for just about anything. You can even set up tool tips, I believe, for things that can't get the focus. Like you can have tool tips for labels. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but there might be a reason that you do. Okay. All right. Next are file choosers and color choosers. You've seen these before. That if you put in a file chooser and you bring it up, literally it'll bring up something like this and ask you to do an open. You can set it up for opening and you can set it up for saving also with these file choosers. And if you want to, notice it defaults to all types. You can give it what's called search criteria and you can tell it to just sur search for JPEG and ping and GIF files or just text files or just .java files, whatever you want to put in there. So notice when you use these, it's JFile Chooser. And as it says, you can set these three things. The re this return value indicates that the user clicked the Cancel button. This one indicates the user clicked the Open or the Save button. This one indicates that an error has occurred. All right. What would that be? Well, you, you might have it set up that they can choose any file they want, but for some reason, even though a file show, it, it shows as being there, it's not really there type of thing or you don't have access to it so you try to open it but you're, you're told you don't have access so you can set up an error condition for it. <coughs> In much the same way you can bring up a color palette. Remember Java has 13 predefined colors, not very many. It'll do the job in most cases but if you're really going nuts you can bring up your own color palette and make it, you know, so how many, would it, how many options does it have? What is that? 17 million? 17.6 million? Something like that. It's either 17.6 or 16.7. All right. All right. Menus next on page 880. These aren't fun either. Okay. There are menu options in the stuff that we just looked at the other day when we did the GUI stuff. So you can you can drag and you can create menus that way, much the same way that you do it in um, in what you call it in uh, Visual Studio. Thank you. All right, but notice when you build these, this is what you have to do. You've got to build the menu bar, which is just the bar to hold it. Then you've got to build the menu. If you want separators in there, you've got to build the separators. If you want one of the items to have a checkbox by it, you've got to put that in. Or radio buttons, you have to put it in. So all these things are explained right here. But it, it ends up being a lot of code bloat if you write things like this. All right. For lack of better words, you've been warned. So if you ever decide to do it like that, it, it can be really a lot of code. Right. A menu item is, instruct, is constructed with the following classes. Menu item, checkbox, radio button, J-menu, and menu bar. It's the same ones I just showed you. It's amazing to just do something like that, how much code it takes. Whereas if I go into Visual Studio, I can create that with no code with about three drag operations. So they have you build this next, starting on page 882. Simple menu that only has two upper level options, file, which has exit under it, and text, which has radio buttons under it, and it has a checkbox under it. And again, so that's not that much code. Well, I don't know if, you know, to me, that's 207 lines of code to build this, where literally, I could build that in Visual Studio in about a 30 seconds. Now, you still have to put code in to make it react. All right, so we look on here, and we look at the stuff that's in here. Notice this is typically how you do it. Build menu bar, boom, you do it. You tell it to build a file menu, and you tell it to build a text menu. And then we've got those things. There's build file menu, so you have to put everything in there. Then you have to basically, as it says, then create the new menu, then set the mnemonic, then add the items to the menu. All right. 
So that's where a lot of this, bless you, that's where a lot of this code bloat comes from. All right. But you still have to register. Bless you. You still have to register these two. Now you've got the items in there. Well, you better register them because if you don't, just, just setting up a menu, they're not smart enough. You can click on them, but they won't do anything unless you put some code in there to tell them what to do. Notice that they implement action listener. All right. So they need an action performed event. Why? Because a lot of times you, you, you put the options in there both with buttons and with menu options. Or maybe you start them up as, as buttons and then you change them over to menu options so you don't have so many buttons on the page. All right. So they both implement the same action listener. They both must they have the same uh, method in there. Okay. He does a really good job of going through this program. Then starting on 886, he walks you through everything that he's done. Even show tells you the line numbers, etc. Okay. Again, a lot of code, 200 lines to build that, and to make it actually, you know, kind of do something. All right, 13.9. So we're up up to page 889. What's a text area? As it says, it's a multi-line field. You already know what these are because we've worked with text areas. In HTML, we've worked with text areas in PHP. We've worked with the equivalent of text areas in C Sharp. All right. Notice when you set it up, you have to tell it how many rows and how many columns you want in it. Notice too that you can set it up like this. As it says, you can pass one of the following constants. By default, it has this, which means basically just give it scroll bars if you need scroll bars. But you can always have scroll bars if you want them, or you can never have scroll bars if you want them. All right. By default, the horizontal scroll bar is needed and the vertical scroll bar is needed. Those are the default options, which means that if it gets too wide, it'll automatically add, or too high, it'll automatically add the uh, scroll bars for you. Okay. So there's no scroll bars, there's a vertical, there's a vertical and a horizontal. Fonts, we haven't done anything it's kind of interesting to me that he goes 890 pages, so probably about a good three quarters of the book, if not more, not even talking a bit about fonts. And what he says is, everything we've been doing thus far, we've been using the default font for everything, which is probably some kind of a serif or sans serif font. But as he says, if you want, you can create font objects. And when you do, you can pass things to them, like uh, bolding italicizing, etc. So know what, notice what we have here. We're setting up a brand new font right there. So see how you do that. Okay. And we're saying that label will have a font that will be serif type. It will be bolded in 24 points. All right. So you could do a lot of things with making stuff bigger or smaller so you can have dramatic changes on your GUI by doing this. Sliders, everybody know what a slider is? We're going to work with sliders in the next chapter. In the next chapter, and again, this won't help those of you who might be watching the tape, but in the next chapter, we're going to build something, literally, it's going to look like this, and it's going to literally, well, th this is a terrible picture of it, but what that's meant to be is a thermometer. Okay? And as it'll have a slider here, and as you move your way up the slider, this will, will all turn red. And as you move your way down, the redness will go away. Do you understand what I'm saying? So a slider is typically used for something like that, where you want to be able to put in ranges. All right. Yeah, it could be all, it could be all sorts of stuff. You can do them horizontally. You can do them vertically. Not only that, you've got control over the tick marks. This is a great example because it's one most people can identify with. So what happens in here is you put in a Fahrenheit number, and as you go and drag the slider, the appropriate Celsius amount, and well, actually both of them will change. Okay. And you can put in here whatever you want to put in here. I mean, you can set this up any way that you want to set it up. Yeah. 
Yes. Yes. And actually, you don't even have to do that. You should be able to just click right there, not even on the number. All right. What what happens is every time that you move it and you, you literally just keep moving it, boom, 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 that's called a small change. And every time you click over here someplace else, that's called a big change. You can also set it up that every time they click on the slider, you can set a small change amount and a big change amount. You can do each one. By default, for example, usually in something like this, small change will default to one, big change will default to ten. But you've got total control over how you do that. So you come in and you create the slider, you set it up for the temperature. Again, that's not that bad, about 100 lines to do that. Okay, right there. All right. Next is look and feel. Okay, and as it says, um, a GUI's app is determined by its look and feel. Typically, that's called a motif. All right, and if you look up on the screen here, because this is the best, that he does a good job of explaining it right here. These are three of the motifs that you have available to you. Notice that, for example, you've got a metal motif, a motif look and feel, and a windows look and feel. And you can use any of these, and there actually are companies that you can buy motifs from. So if you're creating yourself a Java app, you can go out and buy third-party software that has different kinds of motifs. So if you really wanted, the, it's almost like you're talking about like changing backgrounds and the like, backgrounds and coloring by default. All right, you can do it yourself with code, but what I'm saying is there are companies that actually sell these different motifs, so you don't have to go and write all this stuff. You literally just drop it in. All right. All right. Believe it or not, that's it. Okay. So again, what I'm going to do. Uh, while you guys are on your break or whatever, is I'm going to come in here. I've got the, that's, so notice right now I've got what? I, I'm only using point one of what I have available here on this, on this drive. So I've got to look through it. There's still literally gigs of stuff on here. So I'm going to go and search for the stuff I told you about before. Where that is. I'm going to search for that, uh, the e-commerce one that I mentioned to you before, all the ones that were in that, that I, that I said that we were going to do originally. All right, that dormitory thing, and if I find them, I'll let you know, and I'll let you know exactly where the stuff is.